These recordings are the testimonies and narrations of various eyewitnesses regarding the mutiny of the HMS Bounty. I'll only read a short excerpt from the introduction and then continue with Captain Bly's account. The story of the most famous mutiny has many beginnings and many endings, all of which intersect on an April morning in 1789 near the Pacific Island group we now call Tonga. On that morning, Captain William Bly and a handful of barely loyal supporters put off the bounty into a small launch and began the greatest boat voyage in all of history, while Fletcher Christian and the bounty sailed off into a mystery which has never been entirely resolved, despite the discovery of the bounty colony on Pitcairn Island some 20 years later. Bly could have no unusual concerns as he put together the crew of the bounty. As a lieutenant himself, he was limited in the number of rank of officers he could bring along. There would be no other lieutenants and only two regular midshipmen. Other young gentlemen would have had to feel the lesser billets if they wanted to go along. Bly did not have much choice about the ship's surgeon. The appointment of the besotted Thomas Huggan to the bounty may indicate that the vessel was viewed by the Admiralty as a harmless place for dead-end talent. After all, the bounty, although armed, was not a vessel of war. It carried no marines, and the duties of the gunner must have been light. The voyage must have been viewed as something of a lark by Bly's friends. In the end, several of the young crew members would be at variance with the captain. The narrative of the mutiny on board His Majesty's ship, the HMS Bounty, and the subsequent voyage of part of the crew in the ship's boat, from Tofua, one of the friendly islands, to Timor, a Dutch settlement in the East Indies, written by Lieutenant William Bly. The following narration is only part of a voyage undertaken for the purpose of conveying the breadfruit tree from the South Sea Islands to the West Indies. The manner in which this expedition miscarried with the subsequent transactions and events are here related. This part of the voyage is not the first in order of time, yet the circumstances are so distinct from that by which it was preceded that it appears unnecessary to delay giving as much early information as possible concerning so extraordinary an event. The rest will be laid before the public as soon as it can be got ready and it is intended to publish it in such a manner as, with the present narrative, will make the account of the voyage complete. At present, for a better understanding the following pages, it is sufficient to inform the reader that in August 1787 I was appointed to command the Bounty, a ship of 215 tons berth, carrying six four-pounders, four swivel guns and 46 men, including myself and every person on board. We sailed from Portsmouth in England on December 1787 and arrived at Tahiti on 26th of October 1788. On the 4th of April 1789 we left Tahiti with every favourable appearance of completing the object of the voyage in a manner equal to my most sanguine expectations. At this period the ensuing narrative commences. I sailed from Tahiti on the 4th of April 1789, having on board 1,015 fine breadfruit plants, besides many other valuable fruits of that country, which, with unremitting attention, we had been collecting for three and twenty weeks, and which were now in the highest state of perfection. On the 11th of April, I discovered an island in the latitude of 18 degrees, 52 nautical minutes south in a longitude of 200 degrees, 19 nautical minutes east, by the natives called Waitotaki. On the 24th we anchored at Anamuka, one of the friendly islands, from which, after completing our wood and water supplies, I sailed on the 27th, having every reason to expect from the fine condition of the plants that they would continue healthily. On the evening of the 28th, owing to light winds, we were not clear of the islands, and at night I directed my course towards Tofoa. The master had his first watch, the gunner the middle watch, and Mr. Christian, one of the mates, the morning watch. This was the turn of duty for the night. 
Just before sunrise, Mr. Christian, with the master at arms, the gunner's mate, and Thomas Burkett, seaman, came into my cabin while I was asleep, and seizing me, tied my hands with a cord behind my back, and threatened me with instant death if I spoke or made the least bit of noise. I, however, called so loud as to alarm everyone, but they had already secured the officers who were not of their party by placing sentinels at their doors. There were three men at my cabin door, besides the fourth within. Christian had only a cutlass in his hand, the others had muskets and bayonets. I was hauled out of bed and forced on deck in my shirt, suffering great pain from the tightness with which they had tied my hands. I demanded the reason of such violence, but received no other answer than threats of instant death if I did not hold my tongue. Mr. Elphinston, the master's mate, was kept in his berth. Mr. Nelson, botanist, Mr. Peckover, gunner, and Mr. Ledwood, the surgeon, and the master, were confined to their cabins, and also the clerk, Mr. Samuel, but he soon obtained leave to come on deck. The fore hatchway was guarded by sentinels. The boatswain and carpenter were, however, allowed to come on deck when they saw me standing abaft the mizzenmast with my hands tied behind my back under guard with Christian at their head. The boatswain was now ordered to hoist the launch out with a threat, if he did not do it instantly, to take care of himself. The boat being out, Mr. Haywood and Mr. Hallett, midshipmen, and Mr. Samuel were ordered into it, upon which I demanded the cause of such an order, and endeavoured to persuade someone to a sense of duty, but it was to no effect. "'Hold your tongue, sir, or you're dead this instant,' was constantly repeated to me. The master, by this time, had sent to be allowed to come on deck, which was permitted, but as soon, just as soon he was ordered back again to his cabin. I continued my endeavours to turn the tide of affairs, when Christian exchanged the cutlass he had in his hand for a bayonet that was brought to him, and holding me with a strong grip by the cord that tied my hands, he, with many oaths, threatened to kill me immediately if I would not be quiet. The villains round me had their pieces cocked and bayonets fixed. Particular people were now called on to go into the boat and were hurried over the side, whence I concluded that with these people I was to be set adrift. I therefore made another effort to bring about a change, but with no other effect than to be threatened with having my brains blown out. The boatswain and seamen, who were into, got into the boat, were all together collect, to collect twine, canvas, lines, sails, cordage, an eighth and twenty gallon cask of water, and the carpenter to take his tool chest. Mr. Samuel got a hundred and fifty pounds of bread with a small quantity of rum and wine. He also got a quadrant and a compass into the boat, but was forbidden on pain of death to touch either a map, ephemeris, book of astronomical observation, observations, a sextant, timekeeper, or any of my surveys or drawings. The mutineers now hurried those that they meant to get rid of into the boat. When most of them were in, Christian directed a dram to be served to each of his own crew. I now unhappily saw that nothing could be done to effect the recovery of the ship. There was no one to assist me, and every endeavour on my part was answered with threats of death. The officers were called and forced over the side into the boat, while I was kept apart from every one abaft the mizzenmast. Christian, armed with a bayonet, holding me by the bandage that secured my hands, the guard rounded me, <coughs> had their pieces cocked, but on my daring, the ungrateful wretches to fire, they uncocked them. Isaac Martin, one of the guards over me, I saw had an inclination to assist me, and as he fed me with shaddock, my lips being quite parched with my endeavours to bring about a change, we explained our wishes to each other by our looks. But this being observed, Martin was instantly removed from me. His inclination then was to leave the ship, for which purpose he got into the boat, but with many threats they obliged him to return. The armourer, Joseph Coleman, and the two carpenters, Mackintosh and Norman, were also kept contrary to their inclination, and they begged of me, after I was astern in the boat, to remember that they had declared that they had no hand in the transaction. Michael Barron, I am told, likewise wants to leave the ship. It is of no moment for me to recount my endeavours to bring back the offenders to a sense of their duty. All I could do was by speaking to them in general, but my endeavours were of no avail, for I was kept securely bound, and no one but the guards suffered to come near me. To Mr. Samuel I am indebted for securing my journals, 
and commission with some material ship papers. Without these, I had nothing to certify what I had done, and my honour and character might have been suspected, without my possessing a proper document to have defended them. All this he did with great resolution, though guarded and strictly watched. He attempted to save the timekeeper, and the box with all my surveys, drawings, and remarks for the past fifteen years, which were numerous, when he was hurried away with, Damn your eyes! You're well off to get what you have! It appeared to me that Christian was some time in doubt whether he should keep the carpenter or his mates. At length he determined on the latter, and the carpenter was ordered into the boat. He was permitted, but not without much, some opposition, to take his tool chest. Much altercation took place among the mutinous crew during the whole business. Some swore, I'll be damned if he does not find his way home, if he gets anything with him, meaning me. Others, when the carpenter's chest was carrying, damn my eyes, you will have a vessel built in a month. While others laughed at the helpless situation of the boat, being very deep and so little room for those who were in her. As for Christian, he seemed meditating instant destruction upon himself and everyone. I asked for arms, but they laughed at me, and I said I was well acquainted with the people where I was going, and therefore did not want them. Four cutlasses, however, were thrown into the boat after we were veered astern. When the officers and men with whom I was suffered to have no communication were put into the boat, they only waited for me and the master of arms informed Christian of it, who then said, Come, Captain Bly, your officers and men are now in the boat, and you must go with them. If you attempt to make the least bit of resistance, you will be instantly put to death. And without any further ceremony, holding me by the cord that tied my hands with a tribe of armed ruffians around me, I was forced over the side where they untied my hands. Being in the boat, we were now veered astern by a rope. A few pieces of pork were then thrown to us, and some clothes also the cutlasses I have already mentioned, and it was now that the armourer and carpenters called out to me to remember that they had no hand in the transaction. After having undergone a great deal of ridicule, and being kept some time to make sport for these unfeeling wretches, we were at length cast adrift into the open ocean. In all, a dozen and a half hands were in the boat, and twenty-five hands, the most able men of the ship's company, stayed aboard as pirates, notwithstanding three. Having little or no wind, we rowed pretty quickly towards Tofu, which bore northeast about ten leagues from us. While the ship was in sight, she steered west-northwest, but I considered this only as a feint, for when we were sent away, Hurrah for Tahiti! was frequently heard among the mutineers. Christian, the captain of the gang, is of a respectable family in the north of England. This was his third voyage he had made with me, and, as I found it necessary to keep my ship's company at the three watches, I gave him an order to take charge of the third, his abilities being thoroughly equal to the task, and by this means my master and gunner were not at watch and watch. Haywood is also of a respectable family in the north of England, and a young man of considerable ability, as well as Christian. These two were the objects of my particular regard and attention. I took great pains to instruct them, for they really promised, as professional men, to be a credit to their country. Young was well recommended, and appeared to me an able, stout seaman. Therefore, I was glad to take him. He, however, fell short of what his appearance promised. Stuart was a young man of creditable parents in the Orkneys, at which place, on the return of the resolution from the South Seas in 1780, we received so many civilities that, on that account only, I should gladly have taken him with me. But, independent of this recommendation, he was a seaman, and had always borne a good character. Notwithstanding the roughness with which I was treated, the remembrance of past kindnesses produced some signs of remorse in Christian. When they were forcing me out of the ship, I asked him if this treatment was proper, the return for the many instances he had received of my friendship. He appeared disturbed at my question, and answered with much emotion, That, Captain Bly, that is the thing. I am in hell. I am in hell, sir. As soon as I had time to reflect, I felt an inward satisfaction which prevented any depression of my spirits. 
Conscious of my integrity and anxious solicitude for the good of the service in which I was engaged, I found my mind wonderfully supported, and I began to conceive hopes, notwithstanding so heavily a calamity, that I should one day be able to account for my king and country for the misfortune. A few hours before, my situation had been peculiarly flattering. I had a ship in the most perfect order, and well stored with every necessity, both for service and health. By early attention to those particulars, I had, as much as lay in my power, provided against any incident in case I could not get through the Endeavour Straits, as well as against what might befall me in them. Add to this, the plants had been successfully preserved in the most flourishing state, so that, upon the whole voyage, which is two-thirds complete, and the remaining part in a very promising way, every person on board being in perfect health, to establish which was among the principal objects of my attention. It will very naturally be asked what could be the reason for such a revolt, in answer to which I can only conjecture that the mutineers had assured themselves of a more happy life among the Tahitians than they could have possibly had in England, which joined some female connections have probably been the principal cause of the whole transaction. The women of Tahiti are beautiful, mild and cheerful in their manners and conversation, possessed of great sensibility and have sufficient delicacy to make them admired and beloved. Their chiefs were so much attended to our people that they rather encouraged their stay among them as an, uh, than otherwise, and even made them promises of large possessions. Under these, and under many other attendant circumstances equally des as desirable, it is now perhaps not so much to be wondered at, though scarcely possible to have been foreseen, that a set of sailors, most of them void of connections, should be led away, especially when, in addition to such powerful inducements, they imagined it in their power to fix themselves in the midst of plenty, on the finest island in the world, where they need not labour, and where the allurements of dissipation are beyond anything that could be conceived. The utmost, however, that any commander could have supposed to have, hap have happened is this, that some of the people would have been tempted to desert, but if it should be asserted that a commander is to guard against an act of mutiny and piracy on his own ship more than by the common rules of service, it is as much to say that he must sleep locked up and when awake be girded with loaded pistols. Desertions have happened, more or less, on the many ships that have been at the Society Islands, but it has ever been in, within the commander's power to make the chiefs return their people, and knowledge, therefore, that it was unsafe to desert, perhaps led mine to consider with what ease so small a ship might be surprised, and that so favourable an opportunity would never be offered to them again. The secrecy of this mutiny is beyond all conception. Thirteen of the party who were with me had always lived forward among the people, yet neither they nor the messmates of Christian, Stuart, Haywood, and Young had ever observed any circumstance to give them suspicion of what was going on. With such close planned acts of villainy, and my mind free from any suspicion, it is not wonderful that I have been <clears throat> got there the better of. Perhaps if I had had marines, a sentinel at my cabin door might have prevented it, for I slept with the door always open, that the officer of the watch might have access to me on all occasions. The possibility of such a conspiracy was ever the furthest from my thoughts. Had their mutiny been occasioned by any grievances, either real or imaginary, I must have discovered symptoms of their discontent, which would have put me on my guard. But the case was far otherwise. Christian, in particular, I was on the most friendly terms with. That very day he was engaged to dine with me, and the preceding night he excused himself from supping with me on the pretense of being unwell, for which I felt concerned, having no suspicions of his integrity and honour. It now remained with me to consider what was the best thing to be done. My first determination was to seek a supply of breadfruit and water at Tofua, and afterwards to stale at Tonga Tabu, and there risk the solicitation of Puahaulu, the king, to equip my boat and grant a supply of water and provisions so as to enable us to reach the East Indies. The quantity of provisions I found in the boat was 150 pounds of bread, 16 pieces of pork, each piece weighing two pounds, six quarts of rum, six bottles of wine, and twenty-eight gallons of water, four empty barricades. Wednesday, the 29th of April. It's to be observed that the accounting of time is kept in the nautical way, each day ending at noon. 
Happily, the afternoon kept calm until about four o'clock, where we were so far windward that with the moderate easterly breeze which sprung up, we were able to sail. It was nevertheless dark when we got to Tofu, where I expected to land, but the shore proved to be so steep and rocky that I was obliged to give up all thoughts of it and keep the boat under the lee of the island with two oars, for there was no anchorage. Having fixed on this mode of proceeding for the night, I served to every person half a pint of grog, and each took his rest, as well as our unhappy situation would allow. In the morning, at dawn of day, we set off along the shore in search of landing, and at about ten o'clock we discovered a stony cave at the northwest part of the island, where I dropped the grapnel within twenty yards of the rocks. A great deal of surf ran on the shore, but as I was unwilling to diminish our stock of provisions, I landed Mr. Samuel and some others who climbed the cliffs and got into the country to search for supplies. The rest of us remained at the cove, not discovering any way to get into the country, but that by which Mr. Samuel had proceeded. It was great consolation to find that the spirits of my people hadn't sunk, notwithstanding our miserable and almost hopeless situation. Towards noon Mr. Samuel returned with a few quarts of water which he had found in holes, but he had met with no spring or any prospect of a sufficient supply in that particular, and had only seen sides of inhabitants. As it was impossible to know how much we might be in want, I only issued a morsel of bread and a glass of wine to each person for dinner. I observed the latitude of this cove to be at 19 degrees 41 nautical minutes south, for this is the northwest part of Tofu, the northwesternmost of the Friendly Islands. Thursday, April the 30th. Fair weather, but the wind blew so violently from the east-southeast that I could not venture to sea. Our detention, therefore, made it absolutely necessary to see what we could do more for our support, for I determined, if possible, to keep my first stock entire. I therefore waited and rowed along the shore to see if anything could be got and at last discovered some coconut trees, but they were on top of high precipices, and the surf made it dangerous to land. Both one and the other we, however, got the better of. Some, with much difficulty, climbed the cliffs and got about twenty coconuts, and the others slung them by ropes, which we hauled them through the surf into the boat with. This was all that could be done here, and, as I found no place so eligible as the one we had left to spend the night at, I returned to the cove, and having served a coconut to each person, we went to rest again in the boat. At the dawn of day I attempted to get to sea, but the wind and weather proved so bad that I was glad to return to my former station, where, after issuing a morsel of bread and a spoonful of rum to each person, we landed, and I went off with Mr. Nelson, Mr. Samuel, and some others into the country, having hauled ourselves up to the precipice by long vines which were fixed there by the natives for that very purpose, this being the only way into the country. We found a few deserted huts and a small plantain walk, but little taken care of, from which we could only collect three small bunches of plantains, plantains of bananas, sort of. After passing this place we came to a deep gully that led towards a mountain near a volcano, and as I conceived that in the rainy season very great torrents of water must pass through, it, pass through it, we hoped to find sufficient for our use remaining in some holes of the rocks. But after all our search, the hole that we found was only nine gallons in the course of the day. We advanced within two miles of the foot of the highest mountain in the island, on which is the volcano that is almost constantly burning. The country near it is all covered with lava and has a most dreary appearance. As we had not been fortunate in our discoveries and saw but little to alleviate our distresses, we filled our coconut shells with water that we found and returned exceedingly fatigued and faint. When I came to the precipice whence we were to descend into the cove, I was seized with such a dizziness in my head that I thought it scarcely possible to effect it. However, by the assistance of Mr. Nelson and others, they at last got me down in a weak condition, every person being returned by noon. I gave about an ounce of pork and two plantains to each, with half a glass of wine. I again observed the latitude of this place to be 19 degrees 41 nautical minutes to the south. The people who remained by the boat I had directed to look for fish, or whatever they could pick up around the rocks, 
but nothing edible could be found. So that upon the whole, we considered ourselves as miserable a spot of land as could possibly be imagined. I could not say positively, from the former knowledge I had of this island, whether it was inhabited or not, but I knew it was considered inferior to the other islands, and I was not certain but that the Indians only resorted to it at particular times. I was very anxious to ascertain this point, for, in case there had only been a few people here, and those could have furnished us with but a very moderate supply, the remaining in this spot to have made preparations for our voyage would have been preferable to the risk of going among the multitudes where perhaps we might lose everything. A party, therefore, sufficiently strong, I determined to go, should go by another route, as soon as the sun became lower, and they cheerfully undertook it. Friday, May the 1st. Stormy weather, wind east-south-east and south-east. About two o'clock in the afternoon the party set out, but after suffering much fatigue they returned in the evening without any kind of success. At the head of the cove, about 150 yards from the waterside, was a cave. Across the stony beach was about 100 yards, and the only way from the country into the cove was that which I have already described. The situation secured us from the danger of being surprised, and I determined to remain on shore for the night, with a part of my people. And the others might have had more room in the rest of the boat with the master, whom I directed to lie at grapnel, and to be watchful in case we should be attacked. I ordered one plantain for each person to be boiled, and, having supped on this scanty allowance with a quarter of a pint of grog, and fixed the watches for the night, those whose turn it was laid down to sleep in the cave, before which we kept up a good fire, yet notwithstanding we were much troubled with flies and mosquitoes. At the dawn of day the party set out again in a different route to see what they could find, in the course of which they suffered greatly for want of water. They, however, met with two women, a man and a child. Sorry, they, however, met with two men, a woman and a child. The men came over to them to the cove and brought two coconut shells of water. I immediately made friends with these people and sent them away for breadfruit, plantains and water. Soon after, other natives came to us, and by noon I had about thirty of them around me, trading with articles we were in want of, but I could only afford one ounce of pork and a quarter of breadfruit to each man for dinner, with half a pint of water, for I was fixed in not using any of the bread or the water in the boat. No particular chief was yet among the natives. They were notwithstanding tractable, but behaved honestly, giving provisions they brought for a few buttons and beads. The party, who had been out, informed me of having discovered several neat plantations, so that it became no longer a doubt of their being settled inhabitants on the island, and for that reason I determined to get what I could and sail at the first moment the wind and weather would allow me to put to sea. Saturday, May the 2nd. Stormy weather, wind east-south-east. I had hitherto been a weighty consideration with me of how I was to account to the natives for the loss of my ship. I knew they had too much sense to be amused with the story that the ship was about to join me when she was not in sight from the hills. I was at first doubtful whether I should tell the real fact, or say that the ship had overset and sunk, and that only we were saved. The latter appeared to be the more proper and advantageous to us, and I accordingly instructed my people that we might all agree upon one story. As I expected, inquiries were made after the ship, and they seemed readily satisfied with our account, but there did not appear the least symptom of joy or sorrow in their faces, although I fancied I discovered some marks of surprise. Some of the natives were coming and going the whole afternoon, and we got enough breadfruit, plantains, and coconuts for another day, but water they only brought us about five pints. A canoe also came in with four men and brought a few coconuts and breadfruit, which I bought as I had done the rest. Nails were much inquired after, but I would not suffer one to be shorn, as I wanted them all for use in the boat. Towards evening I had the satisfaction to find our stock of provisions somewhat increased, but the natives did not appear to have much to spare. What they brought was in such small quantities that I had no reason to hope that we should be able to procure from them sufficient stock for our voyage. At sunset all the natives left us in quiet possession of the cove. I thought this a good sign, and made no doubt that they would come again the next day with a larger proportion of food and water, with which I hoped to sail without further uh, delay. For if, in attempting to get to Tonga Tabu, we should be blown away from the islands altogether, 
there would be a larger quantity of provisions to support us against such a misfortune. At night I served a quarter of breadfruit and coconut to each person for a supper, and a good fire being made, all but the watch went to sleep. At daybreak I was happy to find everyone's spirits a little bit revived, and they could no longer regard me with those anxious looks which had constantly been directed towards me since we lost sight of the ship. Every countenance appeared to have a degree of cheerfulness today, and they all seemed determined to do their very best. As I doubted of water being brought by the natives, I sent a party among the gullies in the mountains with empty shells to see what they could get. In their absence the natives came about us, as I expected, but more numerous. Also two canoes came in from round the north side of the island. In one of them was an elderly chief called Makakalva. Soon after some of our foraging party returned with them came a good-looking chief called Iji Ifa, or perhaps more properly Ifa or Iji, signifying chief. To both these men I made a present of an old shirt and a knife, and I soon found that they either had seen me or heard of me being at Ananuka. They knew that I had been with Captain Cook, who they inquired after, and also Captain Clark. They were very inquisitive to know in what manner I had lost my ship. During this conversation a young man appeared, whom I remembered to have seen at Anamuka, called Nagati. He expressed how much pleasure it was to see me again, and I now inquired after Puaulo and Fina, who they said were at Tongatabu, and Ifa agreed to accompany me thither, if I would wait till the weather moderated. The readiness and affability of this man gave me much satisfaction. This, however, was b of but short duration, for the natives began to increase in number, and I observed some symptoms of a design against us. Soon after they attempted to haul the boat on shore, when I threatened Ifa with a cutlass to induce him to make them to desist, which they did, and everything became quiet again. My people, who had been in the mountains, now returned with about three gallons of water. I kept buying up a little breadfruit that was brought to us, and likewise some spears to arm my men with, having only four cutlasses, two of which were in the boat. As we had no means of improving our situation, I told our people I would wait until sunset, by which time perhaps something might happen in our favour, that if we attempted to go at present, we must fight our way through which we could do more advantageously at night, and that, in the meantime, we would endeavour to get off to the boat what we had brought. The beach was now lined with natives, and we heard nothing but the knocking of stones together, which they had in each hand. I knew very well this was a sign of an attack. It being now noon, I served a coconut and breadfruit to each person for dinner, and gave some to the chiefs, with whom I continued to appear intimate and friendly. They frequently importuned me to sit down, but as I constantly refused, it occurred to both to Mr. Nelson and myself that they intended to seize hold of me if I gave them such an opportunity. Keeping, therefore, constantly on our guard, we were suffered to eat our uncomfortable meal in some quietness. Sunday, 3rd of May, fresh gales at southeast and east-southeast, varying to the northeast in the latter part with the storm of wind. After dinner, we began, little by little, to get our things in order into the boat, which was troublesome business on account of the surf. I carefully watched the motions of the natives, who still increased in number, and found that, instead of their attention being to leave us, fires were made and placed fixed on for their stay during the night. Consultations were also had among them. Everything assured me that we should be attacked soon. I sent orders to the master that when he saw us coming down, he should keep the boat close to the shore that we might more readily embark. I had my journal on shore with me, writing the occurrences in the cave, and in sending it down to the boat, it was nearly snatched away, but for the timely assistance of the gunner. The sun was setting near when I gave the word on which every person who was on shore with me boldly took up his proportion of things and carried them to the boat. The chiefs asked me if I would not stay the night with them. I said, No, I never sleep out of my boat, but in the morning we will trade again with you, and I shall remain until the weather is moderate, that we may go as we have agreed, to see Paolo at Tongatabu. Makakawao then got up and said, You will not sleep on shore? Then Mati, which directly signifies that we will kill you, and he left me. The onset was now preparing, 
and everyone, as I described before, kept knocking stones together, and Ifau quitted me. We had now all but two or three things in the boat. When I took Nagati by the hand and we walked down to the beach, everyone was in a silent kind of horror. When I came to the boat and was seeing the people embark, Nagati wanted me to stay to speak to Ifau, but I found that he was encouraging them to attack, and I determined, had it then begun, to have killed him for his treacherous behaviour. I ordered the carpenter not to quit me until the other people were in the boat. Nagati, finding I would not stay, loosed himself from my hold and went off, and we all got into the boat except one man who, while I was getting on board, quitted it and ran up the beach to cast the stern fast off, notwithstanding the master and the others called to him to return while they were hauling me out of the water. I was no sooner in the boat than the attack begun by about two hundred men. The unfortunate poor man who had run up to the beach was knocked down, and stones flew like a shower of shot. Many Indians got hold of the stern rope and were near hauling us on shore, and certainly would have done so had I not a knife in my pocket with which I cut the rope. We then hauled off to the grapnel, every one being more or less hurt. But this time I saw five of the natives about the poor man they had killed, and two of them were beating him about the head with stones in their hands. We had no time to reflect before, to my surprise, they filled their canoes with stones, and twelve men came off after us to renew the attack, which they did so effectively as to nearly disable all of us. Our grapnel was foul, but Providence here assisted us. The fluke broke, and we got our oars and pulled to sea. They, however, could paddle round us, so that we were obliged to sustain the attack without being able to return it, except with such stones as lodged in the boat. And in this I found that we were very inferior to them, we could not close, because our boat was lumbered and heavy, and that they knew that very well. I therefore adopted an expedient of throwing overboard some clothes, which they lost time in picking up, and, as it was now almost dark, they gave over the attack and returned towards the shore, leaving us to reflect upon our unhappy situation. The poor man I lost was John Norton. This was his second voyage, with me as quartermaster, and his worthy character made me lament his loss very much. He has left an aged parent, I am told, whom he supported. I once before sustained an attack of a similar nature, with a similar number of Europeans, against a multitude of Indians. It was after the death of Captain Cook on the Morai at Owaihi, where I was left by Lieutenant King. Yet, notwithstanding, I did not conceive that the power of a man's arm could throw stones from two to eight pounds weight with such force and exactness as these people did. Here, unhappily, I was without arms, and the Indians knew it, but it was fortunate circumstances that they did not begin to attack us in the cave. In that case, our destruction must have been inevitable, and we should have nothing left for it but to die as bravely as we could, fighting close together, in which I found everyone cheerfully disposed to join me. This appearance of resolution deterred them, supposing that they could effect their purpose without risk after we were in the boat. Take this as a sample of the disposition of the Indians. There was little reason to expect much benefit if I persevered with my intention of visiting Puahula, for I considered their good behaviour hitherto to proceed from a dread of our firearms, which, now knowing us destitute of, would cease, and even supposing our lives not in danger, the boat and everything we had would be most probable, probably taken from us, and thereby all hopes precluded of us ever being able to return to our native country. We were now sailing along the west side of Tofua, and my mind was employed in considering what was best to be done, when I was solicited by all hands to take them towards home, and when I had told them no hopes of relief for us remained, but what I might find at New Holland until I came to Timor, a distance of a full twelve hundred leagues, where a Dutch settlement was, but in part what of the island I knew not, they all agreed to live on one ounce of bread and a quarter of pint of water a day, Therefore, after examining our stock of provisions, and recommending this as a sacred promise for ever to their memory, we bore away across the sea, where the navigation is but little known in a small boat twenty-three feet long, from stem to stern, deeply laden with eighteen men, without a chart, and with nothing but my own dim recollection and general knowledge of the situation of places, assisted by a book of latitudes and longitudes to guide us. I was happy, however see every one better satisfied with our situation in this particular than myself. 
Our stock of provisions consisted of about 150 pounds of bread, 28 gallons of water, 20 pounds of pork, three bottles of wine and five quarts of rum. The difference between this and the quantity we had on leaving ship was principally owing to the loss in the bustle and confusion of the attack. A few coconuts were in the boat and some breadfruit, but the latter was trampled to pieces. It was about eight o'clock at night when I bored away under a refuge lug foresail, and having divided the people into watches and got into the boat in a little order, we returned God, thanks for our miraculous preservation, and fully conf confident of his gracious support, I found my mind more at ease than for some time.